I'm a fighter. For example, after finishing high school, I left my home and my family and took the first plane here to Germany. I wanted to study biomedical engineering and hopefully someday make a contribution and help change the world. Another example, during my studies, my mother got sick and my father got, had to quit his job in order to take care of her. So I lost, in addition to losing my mother, I lost my economic support. But as I told you before, I am a fighter. So I got up, dusted myself off, and continued studying. And a month ago, I finally submitted my PhD dissertation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Nonetheless, I'm lucky because I'm healthy. If I were ever to get cancer, I wouldn't fight it. I would rather spend the time I have left with my family and my friends. And I'm not the only person who thinks like this. I know a friend of mine who was diagnosed with prostate cancer a couple of months ago, and he decided that he's going to wait until the pain is so unbearable before going back to the doctor or getting any kind of treatment. I know someone back in Ecuador who fought bravely against cancer. And after uh, a lot of fatigue, headaches, and unendless pain, uh, she was diagnosed with cancer again uh, three years ago. So let's face it, even the people who won the war against cancer remain scarred for life, either physiologically or physically or both. And the reason for that is that the gold standard, for, the gold standard treatment for cancer is surgery, chemotherapy, or radiation therapy. In surgery, the tumor is removed from the body. In chemotherapy, powerful chemicals are used to kill fast-growing cancer cells, whereas during radiation therapy, high-energy radiation, like X-rays, is used to treat cancer cells. And the main problem is that these powerful chemicals used in chemical chemotherapy and the high energy radiation used in radiation therapy often target both cancer cells, healthy cells, and especially the healthy cells surrounding the cancer or the malignant tumor. But what if we could lower the damage caused to the healthy cells during radiation therapy? What if we could reduce the side effects or completely avoid them. Well, before I go to the main idea of my project, there are three terms uh, that I need to elaborate on. The first one is scintillators. Scintillators are materials which absorb high energy radiation, like the X-rays used during radiation therapy, and convert them into light, into colors that we can see. Or, they convert it into ultraviolet radiation. That's our second term. Ultraviolet radiation, or UV, is invisible radiation which damages the DNA in cells. And if this damage is not repaired, the cells die. In other words, ultraviolet radiation is toxic. So we propose the use of these scintillator materials and the idea is to bring them into the body, into a tumor, and during a normal radiation therapy session, the cancer cells will be treated with a combination of this toxic ultraviolet radiation and the X-rays. The problem is that scintillators are usually big single crystals used as detectors in medical imaging. So, my part of this project was to reduce the size of these materials into the nanoscale. And that's our third important term, nanoscale. What do I mean with nanoscale? Well, we set up 
to produce these scintillator materials as very tiny, tiny, tiny particles, one billionth of a meter. For example, if you could take apart an ant into one million pieces, each piece would have the size that we need for this project. This size would allow us to really bring these materials into the body or into the tumor. So, that's all the information I had at the beginning of this project. And after some research, we decided to start by screening all the known scintillator materials and looking for the properties that we needed, which were, we needed materials which efficiently absorb X-rays, and we needed materials which produce ultraviolet radiation, strong ultraviolet radiation, enough to kill cancer cells. And that was an easy task. We found a lot of different materials which fulfilled these requirements. The next step was to reduce the size of these materials into the nanoscale. So we chose the materials which have been known to be harmless to the body. And using different recipes, I um, started to reduce their size. And that's the main problem of my project. You see, the smaller particles we got, the less ultraviolet radiation they produced. And even at the nanoscale, they didn't produce ultraviolet radiation at all. So, after three years of research and uh, a lot of different recipes, we found the perfect material, lutetium phosphate. And lutetium phosphate is a high-density material which absorbs X-rays. It, uh, it acts as a funnel, which absorbs all the incoming X-rays used during radiation therapy, for example, and convert them into energy. But, as I told you before, we needed particles which produce ultraviolet radi radiation. Luckily for us, it is possible to introduce small impurities in this material. And these small impurities were two other elements, praseodymium and neodymium. But we are just going to call it PR and ND. And all these elements work as follows. Lutetium phosphate absorbs all the incoming X-rays and produces energy. Praseodymium uses this energy and starts to emit ultraviolet radiation. See, which is, which is the most um, sorry, which is the most toxic ultraviolet radiation. The problem is that PR it cannot use all the energy produced by lutetium phosphate at the same time. And that's why we introduce ND. ND collects the energy uh, produced by lutetium phosphate and gives it back to praseodymium. And this um, combined process works even in the nanoscale. That's why from this combined material, we were able to produce very, very tiny particles which absorb X-rays efficiently and convert them into ultraviolet radiation C, which is extra toxic. And this is what we call the UV nanoforce particles. So, again, to summarize the main idea of this project and my main message for you to take home is that we propose the use of nanoscale scintillators, which can be brought into the body or into the tumor, for example, using an injection or some pills. And during routine treatment, during routine radiation treatment, the cancer cells are treated with a combination of X-rays and ultraviolet radiation C. Therefore, we achieve the same amount of cell death using half the radiation doses. This means that radiation itself will achieve the same outcome, producing less to known side effects. And you may wonder now, does this really work? Does this combined therapy really work better than radiation alone? Well, while we were working here on this material, our colleagues in the United States at the Harvard Medical School 
were testing these UV nanoforce particles uh, on cells, on cancer cells from the lung. And they proved that the combination of these particles not only reduced the needed uh, doses of radiation, but ultraviolet radiation C is extremely absorbed by the cells surrounding the tumor, no, sorry, surrounding the particles, resulting in a very punctual treatment. And as a person from a country with high poverty rate, I'm interested in general solutions, in solutions which can be used all around the world. And that's what inspired me. You see, radiation therapy is used in more than 50% of all cancer patients, either alone or in combination with other therapies. And uh, the combination of the UV nanoforce particles with a radiation therapy could really reduce the amount of um, side effects of this therapy all around the world. However, the development of a new medical device takes around 10 years and $1 billion. Uh, so, yes, it is still a long road ahead of us. And yes, it will be a very expensive road ahead of us. But as I told you at the beginning of this talk, I am a fighter and I'm not about to give up. Thank you very much.